right? They and we are Christ's disciples and Christ's alone. Which, you know, makes sense if the Christian faith is about relating to Jesus Christ and following him, right? Hello, welcome to the Simple Not Shallow podcast, where the coffee is good and the conversation's even better. Hmm. That means it's going to be a very good conversation. Now, recently, I have been hearing a lot about Calvinism versus Arminianism. They make the cycles every now and then. But have you ever noticed that when one ism starts talking about another ism, well, tones get hard, words get harsh, and voices tend to get raised. But aren't we supposed to be one family? See, this has always bothered me. Well, and since everything we look at here is looked at through the lens of what it means to be a Christian? Well, I thought that's what we'd do this time round. Take a look at this whole Calvinism versus Arminianism thing and see what we can see. And just to make sure we're all on the same footing, what we mean when we say Christianity is a following of Jesus, which involves first and foremost a relationship with him, which then leads to studentship from him, which then leads to a life lived from everything we have learned from him. So, looking at this first and foremost through the lens of a relationship with Jesus. Now, how does that help? How does this rivalry, rather, help me in my relationship with Jesus? That's my first consideration. Well, I'll tell you what. Allow me to defer to Paul, who was addressing this very thing in the church of Corinth. Now, granted, 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 he was not dealing with Calvinism or Arminianism as he lived hundreds of years before either of these gentlemen were even born. But, well, have you ever heard the saying that there is nothing new under the sun? Well, you know, this was the very same thing. It, it was happening in Corinth. But then the names were Apollos, Paul, and Peter. And this is taken from 1 Corinthians chapters 1-4. through 4. At this time, factions had begun to arise around these three men in the Corinthian church and it was splitting the church apart. I mean, some were claiming to be followers of Paul, some followers of Apollos, and still others, they were followers of Peter. And with each group saying that they had the right teacher and the right teachings, and so, you know, the others, well, were at best inferior and, at worst, very wrong. Well, hence, there being factions. You know, just as some people today claim to be followers of Calvin or Arminius or any other well-known Christian name in the faith today. And with the same results. Well, the production of strife, jealousy, and division in the church. And because of this, Paul labeled the Corinthian church as worldly, saying, you know, when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being mere humans? Merely a human being. See, they were not growing or maturing in their faith, in their relationship with Jesus Christ. 
See, the embracing of one teacher over and against all others makes us mere human beings and not growing children of God. Isn't that interesting? Also, before someone says, well, there, Mr. C., how can you draw such a comparison between then and now? Paul was speaking to a very specific instance. Well, yes and no. For in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he specifically states that he is using himself and Apollos as an illustration so that we may learn from this and not go beyond what is written and, and once again, this and is very big, and because each side will say, and this is because each side will say that they are the ones keeping the two scripture and the other side is simply getting it all wrong. So we need to take note of this very big and. And so do not take pride in one man teachings, teachings, one man's teaching over or against another. See, this applies to any and all teachers of God. This is how he, uh, excuse me, his use then of he and Apollos is the example we are to use and apply to you know, the teaching of everyone else who teaches us about God. Now, you may be thinking, what? Dude, my head's starting to hurt here. Are we not to accept the teaching of respected theologians and preachers? Don't we need good doctrine? And where do we get that without these teachers? What are we to make of all this, sir? How are we to think about all of our leaders and teachers? Well, I find that Paul answers this as well, and he does so much clearer than I could say it. So, I'll let him do the talking. First, he simply asks a question. He asks, just who exactly is Paul? Who is Apollos? He then answers his own question. They are only human messengers, servants of the one true God. And each one only teaches according, according, don't know what just happened to my voice, according to the opportunity that God has provided to each of them. They were here to point the way to Jesus. So, the Corinthians were to stop identifying themselves as disciples of any one of these teachers. They were not Paul's disciples. They were not Apollos' disciples. They weren't even Peter's disciples. And so, we are not Calvin's disciples. We are not Arminius' disciples or those of anyone else, right? They and we are Christ's disciples and Christ's alone. Which, you know, makes sense if the Christian faith is about relating to Jesus Christ and following him, right? Well, Paul then addresses a wonderful question. You know, since, you know, all teachers of God are teachers of God, but we should not be their disciples or followers. But just how should we regard them? What should we think about them? Well, he tells us quite plainly that we should regard them as who they are, which is fellow Christians who have been entrusted by God to teach us about him. See, they are indeed stewards, and they are ones who must prove trustworthy in the stewardship they have been given. 
And, you know, does Paul give us an understanding of what that stewardship is all about? Would it surprise you that he does? He shares how the focus of all teaching must be Jesus and him alone. It must be directed toward helping us know Jesus and so to grow in our relationship with him, the one true Lord. This is what the studentship is all about. And he even says that his goal was to know nothing among the Corinthians, and so ourselves, except Jesus and him crucified. And Paul even specifically says that he did this while not using fancy, cleverly crafted words or persuasively structured arguments. And he even tells us why he chose this approach. So that we would not be impressed and trust in the wisdom of a mere human being, of a human servant, but that we would only trust the power of God through Jesus Christ. See, Paul wants us to focus on Jesus and him alone for our faith, for all aspects of our faith. So, it seems that to dogmatically focus on the teaching of any one teacher is to then trust in the wisdom of a human servant and to not focus on God himself. So, you know, if any and all messengers are just human messengers, servants of one God, and that they must prove trustworthy in the uh, execution of their stewardship, how are we to know if they are proving trustworthy? Paul even tells us this in 1 Corinthians 14. He says, we are to weigh very carefully whatever a speaker says. We need to test what is said. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, you know, test everything and hold on to what is good and reject the rest. Now, you may be thinking, even the words of our respected preachers and teachers? Yes. Yes, indeed. I mean, the instructions to test things, you know, ourselves and our beliefs included, are found in various passages throughout the New Testament. And I'll list several of those, and indeed, all the passages that I'm referencing in the description area for you to look up for yourself, you know, to make sure I'm not making this stuff up. Now, you may be thinking, okay, okay, test what a teacher says. And just how am I supposed to do that? I mean, honestly, I don't feel very qualified to do that. I don't have a degree, never been to seminary. I do not have years of experience studying the Bible. How can I possibly test these things? I find it very, very helpful to remember something that God's, that we're told about God. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. See, he wants us to know who he is. He wants us to relate to him. And so he wants to teach us what we need to know in order for that to happen. And to remember something James says. When he says, if any of us lacks wisdom, we should ask God for it. And God will give us the wisdom generously. He really does want us to get to know him. Well, in light of this, perhaps the thing to do then is to ask God for wisdom in this and ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. I mean... He is tasked with guiding us into all truth, right? Into teaching us all truth. So, bring it to God and trust that he will teach you what you need to know. Ask him to lead you on this journey. 
and then follow him where he leads and just leave the rest. Now, does he and will he use these teachers and leaders to teach you things? <laughs> well, yes. God does have this rather great tendency to use other people to share himself with you and with me. You know, I even link to three of my favorite ones that I have found on YouTube in the description area for your edification, for your enjoyment, or for you to leave behind if you don't like them. But the thing is to keep your focus on Jesus and not the teacher or that particular messenger's teaching. See, that teacher, after all, is not God. And Paul he uses his status as an apostle to confirm that we should not focus on even an apostle. Never mind anyone else. Focus on Jesus. Now, you may be asking, well, okay, but what do we do if two very respected teachers disagree on things? You know, such as Calvin and Arminius do. What should we believe then? Huh. Good question. And I think the very, very first thing we need to do is take a breath and contemplate all that we've chatted about so far. You know, and, and, and then remember that Paul even says that we see things as through a glass darkly or as dimly reflected, right? We just don't know everything. He says we know in part, we teach in part. So knowing that we don't know everything, not even those teachers, well, the very first thing I would do then is to look at the core of what their teaching is about. Do they teach Jesus as revealed in the Bible? If so, then, in grace, be okay with disagreement on secondary matters. Explore it, but don't feel that you have to have an answer on secondary things. You know, as long as their core teaching is Jesus and Him crucified, then hold on to what helps you grow in your relationship and leave the rest. For each will teach some things that are very right, and each will teach some things that are not completely right. It's part of our human limitation as only seeing things dimly. That is the nature of seeing through a glass darkly. Now, here's an interesting thing. As I was thinking about all this, I did have two other teachings from Jesus come to mind. Well, one was a teaching and one was a prayer. And they do tie directly into this. First, the teaching. Jesus teaches that everyone will know we are his followers by how we love each other. No, 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 no. Seriously, seriously, seriously. By how we love each other not by which teacher or theological idea we hold on to, not how well we can quote, quote Scripture to support it, not any of that. How we love each other. And as Paul stated, you know, when we start embracing particular messengers rather than the one to whom they should be pointing, well, then there is much jealousy, strife, and division. There is not much love there. No wonder Paul says, stop it and focus on Jesus. And the prayer? Well, it was Jesus' prayer that we may be one, even as Jesus is one with the Father. And this just cannot be if we allow strife and jealousy to develop and so become divided over something any messenger says. Well, I think this is probably a good place to wrap things up. I mean, my coffee is close to being gone and all. Now, can more be said about all this? Yeah. And I encourage you to explore this for yourself. And please note, 
I have not said anything about Calvin or Arminius or anybody else, either good or bad, nothing about their teachings. They are not the topic of this chat. The topic is the need to keep Jesus as the focus of all our learning, no matter who we are learning from. See, to lose yourself in a teacher or a teaching is to lose out on Jesus. But to lose yourself in Jesus is to allow him to teach you, to enable you to see what needs to be held on to, you know, from each and every teacher, and to see what needs to be let go of or never picked up in the first place. For Christianity is a relationship that leads to religious ideas and practices, but it is never merely about those ideas and practices. You know, and when it becomes only about the right thoughts and the right words and the right actions, well, you have arrived at the level of the Pharisees. You know, ones who had their religion down cold, they could quote you scripture like nobody's business. But with all that, they had missed out on everything. They had missed out on Jesus. And you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to know merely the religious things, only to find out that I have missed out on the very one to whom all those wonderful things are meant to point. Well, until next time. May you continue to focus on Jesus and trust him to guide you as you test what every teacher says. And take it easy. Take it slow and may coffee into your cup always flow. <laughs>